welcome to this video. This video is about six of the best British punk bands of the 1970s that could easily have made it big. Well, I think so. But what do I know? Well, we're going to find out. Well, let's get down to it and let's go straight in with Eater. <laughs> I first met Eta when Andy Blade, who was the lead singer and the main songwriter, was only 14 years old, though I don't think I knew that at the time. I put them on in Cambridge at my punk gig there, the Dog and Pheasant, called Blimps, one of the first punk clubs in the country, incidentally. I also put them on at the Chancel Hall Chelsea when I did at shows there. I met them through Dave Goodman, who at the time was somebody who I vaguely knew, who was like the engineer and producer for the Sex Pistols demo tapes and he introduced me to this guy Caruso who was the manager of Eater. I think they had a record company together, I can't remember, there might have been a third party who I've forgotten about. It was called The Label. Anyway, it was all very exciting because don't forget back then in 19... 76 I think this was, maybe 77, the start of 77. All this was very new. Stiff Records had barely started, I'm sorry, had it even started? Well, if it had, it had barely started. Eater were a really good band. Andy Blades was not really called Andy Blades, he was Anglo-Egyptian and he had an Egyptian name, which I can't remember, it's something like Ashok or something like that. They were very good, they were very raw, very rough and you could tell they were very young, don't get that, and their aim was to shock. And back then it was um, Andy, shall we call him, and his brother who was on drums. He was replaced by a guy called Degenerate, who wasn't called Degenerate. In fact, there's another member of the band who was called Brian Haddock, who changed his name to something else. I can't remember that. But this is what was happening at the time. But unfortunately, they were too indie, I think. Too raw, too indie to be very big. But they certainly influenced the 14-year-olds. They influenced people like the Dam, the people like that. And I remember one of their first gigs was they went to Manchester and their support band was the Buscox. So there you go. That's Eta. They were had great potential and they were very good and it was all part of my history. And who's number two? The Roots. Now the Roots you probably know because they had a hit, well a big hit, called Babylon's Burning. And Babylon's Burning was a fantastic reggae fused punk song which was like high energy, very poppy, very good, very commercial. In March 1980, lead singer Malcolm Owen was feeling quite unwell. Apart from having sore throats all the time, he also had a heroin addiction, which certainly didn't help. This is despite the B-side of their first single being an anti-drug song. They finished their second album and um, were all set to go on the road for a major tour, their first big one, and it was all sold out from a full throat stroke addiction and the rest of the band sacked him for being unreliable. He renegotiated and got back into the band and before they could actually go on the road he was found dead in his parents house suffering from a heroin overdose. I should also mention that they also toured back in the Scar legend Laurel Aitken just before this and that's probably the last time that they all appeared on stage at the same time. And so what happened was they called the band then, instead of just staying as the Roots, they called it the Roots DC, which is, I think, Latin or Greek, and it goes means going back to the start. See, I'm not a great classical scholar, as you've probably noticed. And the Roots could have done it, but they had so many problems. They were definitely one of the great pub bands. Did I say pub bands? They were definitely one of the great punk bands. Who's next? Who's next is the Wasps. Now the Wasps are an unusual punk band because they were very melodic. I thought they were absolutely great. They 
They never really got the same sort of standing as bands of the time, like The Damned and The Clash and people like that. And I think The Wasps had most potential of all of them. They were from East London. They basically played in a lot of places I went to, like the Bridge House in Canning Town. They played the Roxy. They played the, what's it called? Um, I forget the name. The Vortex, sorry, yes. I'm, see, age keeps keep, 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 up you, doesn't it? Unfortunately, they didn't last long. They broke up, I think it's about 78, 79. And I think all that potential was lost. It's a damn shame. A damn shame. Before we go any further, can I ask you, if you like this, please like and press the thumbs up button and subscribe. If you're not already subscribed, if you subscribe now and if you press the bell, that means that you will be notified when I do videos in the future and you can choose to watch them or not as you think. I, I do various sort of things, all based around, well, it's basically 1960s to 1990s generally. Pub rock, punk, whatever. And also comment, let me know what you want to see, what you like, what you don't like and stuff like that. And if you can share my things and pass them on to people you think might enjoy them, all to the good. You'll be doing a service to the world, won't you? That's got to make you feel good, hasn't it? <laughs> mm. Anyway, who's next? We're going to ask the slip. <laughs> Now the Slits were an unusual punk band because they were all women. And that frightened a lot of people, let me tell you. I think that's partly why they never quite made it. Plus they were very, what's the word? They were very um, avant-garde. Controversial in the much that they made themselves controversial. I think they went out of their way to not be part of the mainstream, but Island Record did everything they could to make them stars. I mean, you couldn't open a copy of The Enemy or The Million Maker at one time without seeing an advert, because you see posters all over London, and yet they never really got there. So there was Ali Up on vocals and Viv Alpatine on the guitar. I thought they were best live in person, and maybe that's why they didn't make it bigger. <laughs> Next, XTC, that's who's next. Oh, we're only making plans for Nigel. XTC were a absolutely stupendous band. They came from, I was going to say Switzerland then, but it was actually Swindon. Not quite as exotic, but they came from Swindon. It was Andy Partridge was the main guy and the main songwriter. Because don't get, they were formed, I think, in 1972, before Punk, so they were around for quite a long time doing things. They were named from, strange you may say, from an actor, Jimmy Durante, an American actor. Did you ever have the feeling that you wanted to go and still have the feeling that you wanted to stay? Who had a very strange phrase in a film. I mean ecstasy. And he pronounced it in three syllables like, I mean ecstasy, or something like that. And it is a great name actually, XTC, ecstasy. Yeah. When the punk thing came, I, I think they were 90% there and they just embraced the whole thing and that's made their sound more urgent. There were never out and out punks. Well, actually, there were no really out and out punks that made it big. One I we used to go to the Roxy and the other one, which I couldn't remember, and I can't remember what it is now. God, what's it called? The Vortex, it's incredible, I mean. These, these used to be like four or five bands on in I and I and 50 or 60% of them would be, what do they for? And they're the ones that you don't hear of now. There'd be a few melodic ones in there. There were ones that weren't punk at all. And, and you wondered how they got booked. But then there were ones which were like 50-50, half and half, and XTC, as well as quite a few of the ones I mentioned here. ET were probably the most punky of all the ones I'm talking about, but XTC and also the Wasps, they were punky with something else in there, as with the Roots, with the reggae. And with XTC, it was all kinds of great ideas and interesting things. <laughs> Unfortunately, what happened was they just got very bad management. Can I say that without being a suit? I hope so. And they didn't really get the right deal, so apparently they didn't get paid royalties and things. So they had very bad deals, and apparently they went on strike and something with Virgin. There's always something going on in the background, and then I think they still could have actually made it, because in, I think it was 82, was it, Andy Partridge suddenly went out on stage one day and found that he just couldn't, well, he was on the side of the stage and found he just couldn't go on that stage. He just had just horrendous stage fright. And from that day forth, he never played live. 
And if you're going to make it in the States, especially, you've got to go out there and they've got to see what you look like first. And a lot of the ways to make it over there are by playing live on things like the Johnny Carson show and all these other chat shows that were at the time. So I think that really held them back there. And here, again, I mean, that there aren't too many bands who never go out and tour because there's a reason why the Rolling Stones, when they have an album out, especially back in the day, would go out and do a worldwide tour because that would help to sell the albums and it would generate loads of money from the live show. So that was a downer. So that's just a bit of a shame, wasn't it? But I think XTC are one of the best bands ever in any genre. So there you go. I've, I've said it now, haven't I? And who's next? Yes, the final one is Alternative TV. They're on a good one. That's better way to tell. Now, Alternative TV, or ATV, to give them their abbreviated name, were led by Mark Perry, and I've got all kinds of um, connections to Mark. A, I used to see him around occasionally when I lived in New Cross and things, and Lewisham, and he lived just down, down the road, so I'd see him at gigs and things, we'd talk. And then he was also involved, before I was actually, with Here and Now. Alternative TV and Here and Now toured together, and it was apparently very successful and plus a well alternative tv play when they reformed in the 80s they played at the cricketers for me and it's a very good experience they were very avant-garde let's get that straight <laughs> I put them in here because I want to talk about them, frankly, because to be honest with you, they would never have made it absolutely huge. But there again, somebody like Pink Floyd could do well, uh, maybe alternative TV, because they weren't obviously the same sort of psychedelic thing. They were much more avant-garde and much more punky. But alternative TV had great ideas. But So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did making it and I hope to see you next time. And if you like this, then, you know, please like. And also as well, I've put a thing up of a video. If you like this, you're definitely gonna like that. So please click on that and go and watch that next. I would appreciate it. I hope you've subscribed, liked, etc., and all that stuff. And we can um, meet again some sunny day. Is that right? Oh, I don't know. Well, thank you for watching. Cheers.